Thank you, and thank you to the organisers for inviting me. Thank you all for being here. It's been very good today to see a common theme running through the video presentations that we've had, and that is about young nationalists not just talking about making things better for our people, but going out there and doing things, actions rather than words. So we saw German youth during the floods helping victims of flooding. We saw in Italy young Italians going out helping the victims of earthquakes. I'm sure you've all seen the videos of Golden Dawn in Greece giving huge amounts of food aid to young Greek families who are very nearly starving thanks to the austerity of the European Union and the banksters. In Britain we are developing that and we're pioneering instead of giving out food in the streets to everybody, giving it out in our best local areas to voters and especially to people who don't vote. The people who when you knock on their door and say will you vote for the nationalists they say we won't vote for anybody because all politicians are thieving lying scum. And whatever you say to them, well, no, we're not thieving, lying scum, we're different. Well, of course, people will say they're different. But it's only doing things which prove that you're different, which will get through to the people who've given up on politics and make them realise that nationalism really is something different from the failed and failing old parties. We have to get through the cynicism which the failures of the old parties has created amongst our people in order to rekindle hope. This is particularly important now because, as I'm sure you know, we nationalists now have real competition. We have the populists, the, the pseudo-nationalists. These range from the ones who are doing politics. In Britain we have UKIP, the UK Independence Party, now working very closely with Alternative für Deutschland. So um, two very similar parties, taking a nationalist vote, sometimes taking a nationalist position, but as you know, they are not nationalists at all. At the other end, that's the political wing, at the street level, you've seen it in Britain with the English Defence League, which I know that people were watching with interest. Let me tell you, there's nothing English about the English Defence League. It's a Zionist front organisation from beginning to end. And in Ukraine, in the right sector, you see exactly the same thing. Good people, genuine nationalists, used and manipulated by Zionists, by biz big business, by the European Union to do their work. It's exactly the same. And in every case, these phony nationalists, these fake nationalists, they're talked up by the people who control the mass media. It's quite remarkable that for 50 years the people controlling the media have only wanted to destroy nationalism. In every single country for 50 years the political elite and the media elite have tried to destroy us in every way possible. And now this has changed. In the last five years it's moved from trying to destroy nationalism to trying to hijack nationalism. This is a wonderful tribute to the work that we have done, people like the NPD, the British National Party, because we have made nationalism so popular, so dangerous, so attractive, that instead of trying to destroy it, our mortal enemies now want to use it. It's a big step forward in historical terms. And they want to use it as a safety valve. And all these populist parties, yes, they talk about immigration. Sometimes they even say we'd stop immigration. They focus on Islam. And yes, Islam is a particular problem. If you're a woman, if you have children, if you have a sister, a political imperialism which says that a woman is worth half a man, of course, it's an enemy. If you believe in free speech, 
or if you like beer. Radical Islam is a particular enemy. Radical Islam mobilizes the immigrant communities in a way that nothing else can. It's a particular enemy. But it's not the only enemy, it's not the sole problem. So people like the EDL, Alternativa, um, Jörg Wilders, they all say, oh, it's just Islam. All the other immigrants are wonderful. No, they're not. Many of the Africans who've swamped Britain, hundreds of thousands in the last five years, they're Christians. They're perfectly good Christians. I don't care. They have no place in my country. They have no place in our Europe. And the worst thing that the Wilders and the Marine Le Pen's, not the old man, but Marine Le Pen, the worst thing that these fake nationalists say is it'll be fine, we just have to slow down the numbers coming in so the ones already here can integrate. Then it'll be wonderful. Again, no. Because integration is not something wonderful. Integration is the destruction, the cultural and the genetic destruction of our peoples. Integration is a form of slow genocide. <laughs> and the genocide of our people was precisely the purpose of mass immigration from the very beginning. So you can't fight it by encouraging the end result, which is the destruction of our people. This is nothing new. I came across just the other day a fascinating piece about a proposal made in 1943 in the United States. It was published on January the 4th, 1943, in the middle of the Second European Brothers' War by Professor Ernest Houghton at Harvard University under the heading, Breed War Strain Out of Germans. And I quote, he produced an outbreeding plan to, quote, destroy German nationalism and aggressive ideology. He envisaged the genetic transformation of the German nation by encouraging the mating of German women with non-German men who would be brought into the country in large numbers. He said it would take 20 years at least to, quote, encourage the immigration and settlement in the German state of non-German nationals, especially males. He went on to say, the objects of this measure include reduction of the birth rate of pure Germans and neutralization of German aggressiveness by outbreeding, unquote. That was the plan to destroy Germany by destroying the peoples of Germany through mass immigration in 1943. Did it happen? Not just in Germany. You go to France, you go to London, go to Copenhagen, go to Oslo, go to all our cities, even go to our small villages, and you will see this happening, not just to the Germans, but to all the peoples of Europe right now. You turn on your television and the adverts, the newscasts, everything you will see, it's all, all over Europe, the same message. White people are so bad, so evil, we must be bred out of existence. This is genocide. Now, in fact, this plan, still going on, it's older than 1943, a point to which I'll return in a minute. But I want to point out again, it cannot be stopped by assimilation, because assimilation is the end of this process as first envisaged in any case. So it cannot be stopped by the populists. They steal our votes by talking about the symptom, but they deliberately ignore the cause and their solution is in fact the end result of the evil process in the first place. But because of the support they have in the mass media, to an extent it's working. All of our parties are under tremendous pressure from these phony nationalists and their big media backers. We all know that. And it's frustrating. They could well take my seat. They could well stop the NPD getting a third seat. 
I don't think they'll stop the MPD getting one, and I hope two, but um, they are in the way, and it's frustrating. But it must also be a source of hope to us, partly because, as I've already said, it shows that our ideas are on the march, so much so that instead of trying to block us, they have to try and steal and hijack us. But it's also because as these parties grow, as the mass media talk them up, they wake some people up. Not wide awake, like us, but a bit awake. Awake enough to start to think. It's very, very important. They set people on a conveyor belt or an escalator of radicalization. And someone who starts just by saying, I think we're paying too much taxes for these asylum seekers. Once they start looking on the internet, once they start thinking about the ideas and the issues, they're very likely to end up with a far better, wider understanding of what's going on. So they radicalize themselves, especially if our ideas are on the internet being effectively expressed, because we can help that radicalization. In the 1960s, certainly in Britain, and I think in most countries in Europe, the far left, the Marxists and the Maoists, had a, a wide-ranging policy of physical entryism, actually joining social democratic and socialist organizations to spread their more radical version of egalitarianism. Now, I don't believe that physical entryism into groups like UKIP or Alternativa is for us. We don't have the manpower. We need our people doing things for our parties and for our people openly. But we do have the capacity for ideological entryism, to get our ideas into those parties, particularly with the internet, but also as individuals, each of you. If you meet someone from one of these phony parties, instead of being hostile, instead of telling them exactly how dangerous and bad they are, I think it's better to talk with them and to look for common ground, and then try to lead them gently from where the, what they understand now to understanding a more genuine, rounded, full version of nationalism to help them see the real picture. Because their leaders are the enemies of our cause, but their people, their followers, are good-hearted people who are part way to being with us. They're nearer to being with us than the socialists, the liberals, the capitalists. They're almost there, and it's our job to help them, not to attack them and drive them so they're just in their own closed little world. And partly with that in mind, particularly with our enemy in Britain, UKIP, and understanding and having met some of their people, and they're beginning when you talk to them, they talk about things they've read on the internet, they talk about the banks, the Bilderbergers, the Trilateral, Trilateral Commission, the Frankfurt School. They talk about these things. So to help make it clear to them how much their leadership isn't telling them how bad their leadership is, I took the advantage of the opportunity the other last week in the European Parliament to make a short speech about this issue. In the European Parliament, as I hope Dr. Rose will find very soon, there's a ration of democracy. You have one minute. 60 seconds is your ration, usually for a week. But in that 60 seconds, you can say whatever you like. Whatever you like. There's no one else in the chamber. There's no debate. It's not democracy. It's a little fig leaf on a name of liberal totalitarianism. But you can say what you like, and your party and your people can use what you say because it's all televised with a fantastically expensive professional system. So it's televised and it's translated. So you can see this. I'm going to read you this, this speech in a moment in English. But so you can see it in German because it's automatically translated into all the languages. So you can go on. I'll probably be talking as a woman, as a matter of fact. <laughs> it just depends what translator's on duty. But I had this to say to, and the few who were there heard what I said in absolute horrified silence. When the godfather of the European Union, Richard Kutenhoff Kalergi, published the plan for a united Europe and the ethnocide of the peoples of Europe, the encouragement of mass non-white immigration was central to the plot. Since then, an unholy alliance of leftists, capitalists, and Zionist supremacists 
have schemed to promote immigration and miscegenation with the deliberate aim of breeding us out of existence in our own homelands. As indigenous resistance to this human genetic modification industry grows, the criminal elite seek new ways to camouflage their project. First, the immigrant pawns were temporary guest workers. Then, it was a multiracial experiment. Then, they were refugees. Then, the answer to a shrinking population. Different excuses, different lies. And asylum is just another one. But the real aim stays the same. The biggest genocide in human history. The final solution of the Christian European problem. This crime demands a new set of Nuremberg trials. And you people will be in the dock. So I gather from your reaction that you understand that when I said you people, I don't mean you people, I mean them, the people running the European Union. So I look forward to welcoming and advising MEPs from the NPD to Brussels in just a few months time. We have a great deal in common. In fact, uh, the first idea for a speech, for this speech, that I had written, I had to tear up because Dr. Rose delivered my speech for me. <laughs> unbelievable, so, so close where we stand. But it's not unbelievable, is it? Because we are brothers in this fight. And I also look forward to working very closely with the MPD because this immigration genocide problem has gone on so far, it's now so far advanced, that I'm quite convinced that it's not possible to have a successful, lasting national revolution in one country. I'm not a Trotskyite, but I don't believe you can have a revolution in one country. Because if we had a national revolution, for, for instance, in France, where you might have something which looks like a national revolution with the Front National taking power. It's possible in a few years' time. We need a big economic downturn, but the big economic downturn is coming, so it's possible. But if that happened, what would happen in Paris? I'll tell you what would happen in Paris, because we've just seen it in Kiev. You would have enormous demonstrations of communists of liberals, of Islamists, of all sorts of black Africans with bones through their noses and spears, you would have a two million, three million strong demonstration of the anti-nationalist forces and the nationalists would simply be driven out. That's the simple truth. That was one of the reasons they created this mass immigration in the first place. It's people who intended to loot our countries to death, taking over our public services as the Italians were protesting about and so on. And they knew that if Germany was peopled by Germans, sooner or later the Germans would say, no, we don't want to be robbed. Enough of this Germany for the Germans and our national assets for us. And the same in Italy, the same in France, and the same in Britain. So by deliberately creating this mass immigration, so that in the end, our people are so busy hating the Muslims, and the Muslims are so busy hating our people, and we're so busy squabbling over which bit of the cake we get, that we uh, uh, don't notice the fact that the capitalists, the bankers, have really taken all the cake and we're squabbling over the crumbs. But that process has gone on so far now that, as I say, national revolution in one country is not possible. We have to have it in country after country after country so that instead of the nationalists defending the gains somewhere, we're pressuring the capitalist elite and we're taking more countries off them. So instead of us defending, we have to be on the attack all the time. So nationalists have to work together. We are in a war for our survival. The one good thing about that is in this case, after two European brothers' wars, 
there is at least the possibility that in the third war for the survival of Europe, we European brothers and sisters will all be on the same side. One more thing. When I say we European brothers and sisters, let me make this clear as I gather from speaking with NPD leaders that you understand as well, but other people will be watching this video for months or years to come. So let's make this clear that when we say European brothers and sisters, we include Russia. Not as just another player, but as an absolutely crucial part of this. Russia is absolutely vital, because Russia is the last great white country left which hasn't been devastated by mass immigration, by 50 or 60 years of the deliberate destruction of our own people in our own country. Russia is still a European nation in a way that, I'm sorry, Britain isn't and Germany isn't. Look at Nuremberg, look at Berlin. It's a, it's a, is it a German city? No, it's a Turkish city. Moscow is a European white city. And the future of the white European people and of our civilization will only be secure when among the European nations who have turned to nationalism there are the two most important. There has to be an alliance, a close connection as sovereign nations, but working as real allies between the enormous economic power that is the centre of modern Europe, which is Germany, and the enormous population and the, shit, the reservoir of our people, which is Russia. An alliance between Russia and Germany is the only thing, in the end, which can save the white race in the world. And it's only possible under nationalism. And that's why our struggle, your struggle here in Germany, is so incredibly important. It's a big step, isn't it, from where we are now to the idea of having a Europe dominated by free nationalist states as big as Germany and Russia, and with Britain and France and Italy and the smaller countries like Sweden, symbolically very important. It's a big step from where we are now to having even one nationalist state, let alone having a dozen nationalist states working in close cooperation, sovereign, but as allies. It's a big step. It's a long road. How do you get to the end of a long road? You start walking. So, this year, as you know, 2014, it's 100 years from the anniversary of the beginning of the European Civil War and the great cataclysm which devastated our people and left the gap which our enemies were able to fill with mass immigration. And late in June, the anniversary of the shots in Sarajevo that set in motion that conflict, the European elite are meeting in Ypres, in Flanders. And they're going to have a great big dinner at taxpayers' expense uh, to celebrate or commemorate the outbreak of the First World War. And I suppose they're going to be saying, it must, saying, it must never happen again, we must never fight again. It's so good we've got European Union because we'll never fight again. Because Germany and France and Britain may not fight again. But what a nerve, what a cheek, what a hypocrisy. Because these bastards who are going to be saying, we must never fight again, are trying their hardest to drag us into a war with Russia right now. Another bloody European Brothers War. <laughs> so what I want to see, and I'm proposing, I proposed to several nationalist leaders privately and everyone's agreed, so it's a go. But this is the first time we're doing it publicly, is to say that when the warmongering EU elite are there in Ypres at the end of June, that young nationalists will also be there from every country in Europe with our flags, all standing under a common banner of no more brothers wars, and meaning not just talking about the past, 14 to 18, 
39 to 45, but also no to a brother's war with Russia in the future. We will not fight their wars. We will not commit their crimes. We will put them on trial for theirs, and we will build a better Europe of free peoples. Danke schön. Thank you very much, Nick Griffin, for this speech. Thank you very much that you demonstrated us why you are one of the leaders, maybe the, the one, of national movements in Europe. And especially, thank you very much that you mentioned Russia and the problem why they are under such a big pressure right now. I have been 55 times in Russia in the last 30 years, and I know what's going on there. And you, of course, you are right. It's the, the last capital in Europe, which is the Russian and the typical European one. And so we, we all have to defend it and have to stay together. Thank you very much. And I hope that we both will, you again, and me for the first time, Udo Vogt for the first time, meet us in Europe, in I Strasbourg, so. in Brussels. Thank you very much. Let's fight together.